Welcome to Deep Look, Ulti World's weekly radio show about the current state of Ultimate. I'm the host and the editor of Ulti World, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Keith Rayner. Keith, I hope you had a lovely Thanksgiving, and of course, to all of our listeners out there, to you as well. Uh, how was your long weekend? It, enjoyable, relaxing. It was good to see family. Uh, good to introduce Miles to uh, my wife's ex- excited, extended family, uh, and just to you know r- relax for a little while uh, because there's there's a lot of work to be done on our end uh, as we come into the winter, which is not usually what we've got going on in uh, in December. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's like uh, normally this is like a, okay, thinking about next year, mm-hmm. getting ready for whatever you know, we're planning for in 2022. And right now it's like, nope, getting ready for everything coming up in the next three weeks. So it's fun. It, it, I, I'm really looking forward to college nationals. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, the, the logistics though, man, like Norco is just not in an ideal location. <laughs> now, if you live on the West Coast, it's probably not too bad because you can fly into Ontario Airport. But like good luck getting good flights into Ontario Airport if you're coming from further away and then if you fly into LAX, which is of course is the most common airport to get into the area, it's a drive to Norco. So it's going to be a little crazy, but, um, and I'm sure teams are dealing with this too, but at the end of the day, we get to have college championships and that's a lot of fun. I, I hope that the logistics won't be, uh, overbearing. I know they can be, uh, it can be aggravating when you're faced with a with a long drive to and from the airport, especially when you're doing multiple pickups like we are. So maybe, maybe our logistics management group can uh, can tie everything together. We can. We, do we have an algorithm for this, Charlie? To, to that's what we it? need. We need AI to do this stuff. Yeah, we need to like get like I, I always think about you know these major companies that have logistics issues like you know FedEx or uh, the airlines or Amazon like. How their AI manages all the inputs to like have everything work. The air, the air, the air flight system is insane to me. I mean, like I how have, all that stuff's coordinated seems impossible. Yeah, like custom built software to do all of the like route management and like where are your planes? You have to know where your planes are at all times. It's That's wild. wild. Um, really quick before we jump into a mailbag episode today. I mean, this is technically mailbag. In our subscriber bonus segment last week, we talked a little Thanksgiving. And some of our favorite foods and uh, pro tips, etc. We got an email from Mike who said, let's start with full-throated approval for the leftover breakfast pie and sandwich. But as your proportions shift and you find yourself with more turkey than other leftovers, please do not miss using Harissa on your turkey sandwich. Powerful victory at hand. I feel like that's very good advice. I could even see Harissa and cranberry sauce on the sandwich being can, an excellent that, combination. That seems good. I mean, the fact of the matter is turkey is bland. It's a it's a lame protein. And so you need extremely flavorful things like Harissa to, to fire it up, you know, to, to bring bring the flavor. Uh, how did how did you feel about your, your Thanksgiving meal, by the way? Meal's great. Here's a problem, though. As of my wife's families, we got no leftovers. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. We took we I, I, the, the the person hosting ours had purchased extra plastic Tupperware for people to take home leftovers, which was a, a nice nice thought. So we we escaped with, of course, some dessert. Uh, I, I took some blondies to go, uh, which was a, a a decision I don't regret at all. Uh, it was it's been wonderful <laughs> having some extra blondies around the house, and then you have some turkey, some mashed potatoes, the the left the leftover sandwich ingredients that we would need, and we purchased some bread beforehand. So we're going to dig into some mailbag here today. Uh, we got a lot of questions on a lot of different topics. So let's just go ahead and dive in. Maisie is pumped up. I am pumped up. Uh, Keith, where do you want to start? Grab a grab a piece of mail here. Uh, pull, pull something off the pile. Huh? I, I, we, we need to get physical mail. We should have printed all these out so we could like physically grab them for our YouTube audience. If, you, if you're watching on YouTube, you know, of course, you gotta gotta hit us with the like, the thumbs up. We appreciate Pu- that. Publish my home address. <laughs> I don't know if you want to do that. Uh, I think <laughs> wow, a PO box I guess might I be in order. PO box. That, uh, that is the way to do, get around that. All right. Uh, so let's let's start with let's start with this one because uh, we were just talking about this topic. So, what are Ulti World's logistical challenges for covering the college championships in December? 
Um, and then there's a corollary question. What are the challenges for teams? Uh, we can maybe tackle them both. I think everybody's dealing with the same thing. It's extremely expensive this year to get out there. Um, obviously, if the teams who are local are lucky, but even for them, you know, you're not local enough. <laughs> Nobody's in Norco. So you have to get hotels. It would be crazy to try to drive to and from LA each day, I think. Um, so it's just expensive because you're in the, you, especially the return flights, you're in the Christmas window. So flight prices are extreme, like the worst I've ever seen for a national championships. And when you get a, you know, a, a, a large team of players, or a big team of, of you know media folks covering the event like we do, that's just a big challenge. Um, you know, housing and hotels not too bad, a little expensive but not crazy. Uh, I think the, the bigger challenge is going to be you know just dealing with the costs and dealing with the transportation from multiple airports. Uh, it's not super conveniently located to a single airport, and so you got to be able to figure out how to manage all that. So. I think we learned a lot at club nationals about how to handle this. And, uh, you know, I'm sure teams dealing with it too. At least rental car prices are not too bad. That's what I've seen. Def definitely difficult timing with the near, near the holidays and just by the nature of traveling for an event that you have to qualify for, you can't pre-plan, you know, you can't buy your tickets in May or whatever to try and save on money, uh, to, to e ease the logistics here, you know, traveling with a big group, like all two world, we're mostly disparate parts that join together here. So you don't have to worry about the, or benefit from in some cases, you know, like carpool into the airport or something like that. But uh, we do all travel separately, but for a team, you know, you're trying to get everybody roughly probably in groups. I, I've, I've never qualified for the college championship. So I guess I don't know that for a fact, but uh, in my team experience flying, you know, we had people who are mostly flying together uh, to make their experience more enjoyable uh, and doing all the logistics work for that can, can certainly be a challenge. The extra cost, though, is, is definitely – that's the biggest one uh, by a long shot. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing, of course, is, you know, COVID situation. How, how are you managing the potential risk of a breakthrough case that causes your entire team to get DQ'd? Uh, that's a challenge. I think there's multiple ways to attack it, but, you know, multiple rental cars, multiple hotel rooms, separate flights, the whole thing, right? It adds up. It adds up with cost. So uh, I think a lot of teams are probably dealing with that. And we, I've seen an enormous amount of fundraisers posted online this year, more than I've ever seen for teams trying to get some funds from alumni and parents and friends and such, um, which I think is a very sensible way to, to offset costs. And look, now, now you have these seventh year players, they have jobs maybe, uh, you know, and now you got extra people, so you have more Finals. network to touch into to tap into. You know, it's it's, it's helpful. Uh, it, it, additional challenge for for us more than the teams themselves, although this is also a challenge for USA Ultimate. Let's not forget is that D one and D three are being conjoined for this yes. event for the first time ever. So we're going to be covering two tournaments at once, and USA Ultimate is trying to host two tournaments at once. Even the club championships, which are sizable, uh, have three divisions, and essentially here we're going to have four divisions. All right, so the Club Nationals has 48 teams, mm -hmm. and this tournament is going to have 72 teams. It's a big number. That's, That's like world teams. size. It's huge. So let's get to another question on this topic. Butler asked, what are the odds that if Fall Nationals in California goes well with both D1 and D3 at the same event, that USA Ultimate considers making a switch to a permanent blended event that happens over the same four-day weekend? This feels – it feels like if it goes well, this feels like it it is a, not a certainty, but I mean I would I place the odds pretty high. You know, I, I would uh, – I, I don't want to necessarily give it betting odds, but if I were to give like a percent probability, you know, I would say 75, 80 percent. Uh, now my – I'm fairly skeptical that it is going to go well because of the challenges inherent to hosting the events at the same time. Uh, you need – less volunteers probably to, to pull it all off but having to to having to have your volunteers and you can't separate them per se you can't have the same group of people same group of employees uh you know stay for a week and work both events or something like that uh having to get having to get all the people in place and pieces in place to hold, host such a huge event 
is challenging. Finding a venue that can host a huge event. Like these are challenges that are going to be uh, present anytime you try and host the conjoined event. But if it does go well, I don't see a reason that USA Ultimate wouldn't want to continue with this. A bigger, more celebratory event with more people, I think is probably in their benefit in the long term and not having to rent two two sites and two weekends and send all their employees there for two weeks uh, is also probably beneficial. It's just, it's so much more efficient. I mean, we've already seen the trend of having the two events, you know, back-to-back weekends within driving distance of one another. So clearly like there's already a sense that like we need to create economy of scale here by having it be, you know, we just travel once and we can take our U-Haul and then just drive it a couple hours away to do D1. But I, I agree. I, I think that the real challenge, the primary challenge is that it because there's so many teams, it's restrictive to where you can hold the tournament. But but I think with the way the pace of the tournament is, where teams are playing two pool play games, you know, D1 teams playing two pool play games on day one, two pool play games on day two, and the D3 you're basically able to slot those games in what is normally a two-day event over four days. All of a sudden, your field space limitations kind of get reduced because, you know, you can push more games to day three, semis day, because you know you're going to have the D1 semis back to back to back to back on a single field with, you know, the ESPN streaming. So then, you know, if you need to get some quarters or semis or whatever else in that day, which I think they already do quarters in the morning and then semis in the afternoon, like it's pretty reasonable. So then it just comes down to those first two days and how you manage the pool play. But with enough buy rounds, it's not like every team is playing at the same time all at once. That's that, that I think is, is in my experience, tournament planning. Uh, if you're, if you've never planned a tournament format before or schedule, you, you sit down and you probably do it in chronological order. You're like, okay, so let's start with pool play and figure all that out where everybody's going to be. But the actual bottleneck is your first rounds of elimination play right. where buys are are very rare. Now, I think the USA Ultimate's going to have the opportunity to stagger some of this, some of the rounds of play, pre-quarters and quarters, so that they don't have to happen all on top of each other. But that's when most teams are competing at the same time. So it can be really difficult to plan for your space because that's the time. You have to figure out when's the time when literally the most teams I'm going to have playing at the same time is because that's going to dictate how many fields I need or how I need to stagger the schedule. I do think USAU is well-equipped to handle that, but that's where the bottleneck is going to be for for space and time. I think people don't appreciate sometimes how good USAU is at handling those kinds of logistics. Like when's the last time you can remember an event where there was like a major snafu with field scheduling or, you know, stuff getting totally messed up. I mean, the thing I remember is Worlds 2018. Obviously, that's not a USAU event. And that was like, in some ways, out of the control of organizers because it was significant weather over, you know, 12-hour period. But it just doesn't happen. Like, things go smoothly at USAU events almost always. And, you know, there's little stuff, but their ability to manage these large-scale events, like, Think about U.S. Open YCC. I mean, how many teams is that? That's hun- hundreds of teams typically. And obviously, there's not very many field sites that can handle that. They have the one in Minneapolis. <laughs> uh, I think the challenge is, you know, can you get that kind of field site over Memorial Day weekend when there are a lot of other college sports having big tournaments? I, I think so. But let's see how this goes first. U- USA Ultimate, it's time for them to to just buy the the field complex in Minneapolis, and they can they can rent it out to soccer teams when they feel so inclined. When they're when we're not in season, they can just move the headquarters to Minneapolis to Blaine, Minnesota, and we can just play all the big tournaments there. It would be convenient, right? I mean, we Milwaukee, got a big Milwaukee Ultimate just bought Polo Fields in you know outside of Milwaukee. Uh, that they had been using for many years, you know, renting from the polo folks, and then they bought them outright with money that they'd saved over literal decades, and now own them. I I don't know the economics of buying land uh, and then renting it out, but it seems like it's a good you know real estate's always been a profitable racket, right? It's a great time to have real estate, especially if you think inflation is is for real. Yeah, so you know 
Make the investment. What's next, Keith? All right. Um, let's let's start. We talked a, a bit about college championships, so let's talk a little about the club championships here. Um, how about this one? Uh, mm, oh, actually, there is one. There is one college championships question left that that uh, I feel like it was important to address. I, I actually talked a little about this on Twitter, uh, be, but it's about my baby hashtag the game. <laughs> so you and I talked about there are basically like there will be seeds, but kind of in name only. Like there, are, if 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 we truly see randomized seeding, asterisk geographically locked or whatever it was, whatever the terminology was that we don't really know what that means, but uh, close to random seeding, seeding not based on performance from a regular season that didn't happen. Uh, how will we be able to do what we do for the game for? For college, which is based on seeds, where you get points equal to the to the seed of the team that you pick uh, every time that they win. Well, seeds are going to be meaningless now, so uh, they won't really be useful. I think what we'll probably have to do is just manually decide the value of teams, um, whether that be basically like assigning a seed like number to them, or by doing some sort of Daily fantasy style, uh, you know, pricing of teams, which which would make it a little more like club, where you're trying to find the right combination of teams to get you the most points. I think we'll probably do something like that, where it'll be like we've all seen the, the graphics on on social media that you see on like ESPN posts these kinds of things all the time. Like you have fifteen dollars and you're trying to build yeah. the best X Y Z. You know, people do it with Thanksgiving meals or whatever. Try you're trying to build the best Thanksgiving plate and you have. $15 and then randomly assigning the price, not randomly, uh, assigning prices to items. Something like that with a salary cap uh, where you pick teams based on that. So that's the most likely outcome here. We'll still have something. It'll still be fun and challenging. And uh, surely somebody will blow us away with their performance like like we saw at club championships. Yeah. I, and I think a lot of it depends on how the seating actually ends up getting done. We still don't really have knowledge of what the mechanism is going to be. <laughs> Are they going to just literally throw them all in a pot? And pick at random and then you know redraw if they end up with somebody from the same region in a pool i don't know maybe but maybe they're going to make tiers of teams and you know put them into a pot and then you do your tier one teams your tier two teams for each of the pool seating levels which would be a little bit i mean still randomized but it's a little bit more structured kind of the way they do it with uh you know world cup we don't know so it depends but i think we'll figure it out Keith, Keith, Keith's going to figure it out. I know this. <laughs> I will. I, I would never, never have. We can't have another college championship without the game. It's just, it, it, this is locked in. It's locked in. Uh, all right. I, I'll, let's go to this one. Um, the ultimate swan. Cap or fact? Momentum is overrated. People comment on it swinging back and forth due to big plays, breaks, etc., but in, in my opinion, the overall atmosphere changes the game more than reactions to those small moments. It's not anything like NBA streaks. Cap or fact, Keith? Uh, I agree with some of this, but this I think this is a pretty contentious issue. You're the, the I'm surprised that we haven't had a social media fight about this, uh, that this hasn't been a topic to sure. Do you believe in momentum or not? Uh, I certainly think that human beings by nature, you know, are are likely to have expectations about things continuing through, through patterns. So, you know, if you're playing poorly, it can get in your head. Different people are going to respond to that different ways. Uh, I think that's what creates a lot of momentum. It's not some mysterious force. It's just human beings reacting to events in front of them and what their expectations are going forward. Now, there are some things, you know, in game flow in certain sports that create momentum. So, you know, in basketball, if you're, getting out on transition and you're stopping your opponent from putting the ball through the hoop with defense, uh, it's harder for them to set up defensively and that can lead to a lot of points really quickly. Or if you're hitting a lot of threes or contested shots, uh, you know, in, in football, it, you know, if you're getting out to a lead, can you establish the run? Is your, does your opponent have to throw to keep the clock from stopping? You know, all these types of things are game flow elements that can feel a little bit like momentum as in they, they change 
how the atmosphere of the game is, what the tactics are necessary, like wh- th- those kinds of things matter. Uh, it, they're less pronounced in Ultimate, though, because each point basically just resets afterwards. Uh, there's some elements of that with like the halftime break, uh, you know, approaching a cap, those kinds of things. I don't, I, I think momentum is probably properly rated. I don't think, I think it's maybe more of a narrative device uh, when you hear it talking about it in commentary and stuff like that more than it is an actual like impact on players. Uh, but I do think it exists, like people respond to it. Yeah, whether or not it's a real actual concept that is like somehow, you know, your fate that, you know, oh, the momentum is swung and there's nothing we can do. Like now our team is struggling to catch up and like they're pulling away. Like that's not really accurate. I mean, I think we could all probably agree to that. But I do think psychologically there's this element of um, self-fulfilling prophecy there where it's like, ooh, we just had a bad turnover and now people are getting tight. And so then we have another bad turnover. And it's not because the you know momentum f- fairy has come around it's that like you're feeling that pressure and therefore it is causing you to then like sort of compound mistakes or compound success and so that that to me like I, i've seen games where clearly a play has completely changed the tone of the game changed the tenor of the game and their one team has much more momentum after that point and they score four or five in a row now Again, I think that's more to do with the like psychology of the individual players. And so as a coach, I think you want to try to snap people out of that if it's in a if it's going in a negative direction be like, "Look, we played bad those two points. Time out. Like let's just go out there and focus on, you know, watching the disc into our hands and making, you know, good quality pivots and throws." And that is part of coaching, but I do think that, you know, I think it's wrong to dismiss the concept because I do think that there are obviously times in Ultimate where individual plays can swing a game. I mean, I I feel like how can you watch Ultimate and not see that 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 happens sometimes? It's it, sometimes you over ascribe what has happened to momentum. I think like you know looking backwards, you 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 can get caught up in oh this was. The momentum swinging play rather than than you know the actual events of the game, but I mean we've all been there when one of our teammates does something awesome on the field when we're in need of, of energy, and suddenly the team feels fired up and there's a renewed sense of purpose. Uh, that means that there was a sense of purpose lacking at some point, but those kinds of ebbs and flows are just a natural part of competition. Uh, you know, I, I while as much as as a coach you want your team to be you know even keel you want to you want to try and find that equilibrium it's also you know a fun exciting part of the game to be in competition and have the situations be shifting so uh, you know we talk about energy driven teams and you can see teams who are like that when they're playing poorly they have trouble getting back out of it without something sparking that drive you know it's not just oh we had a great possession they usually rely on a big play to get them back into it uh and that sort of fires teams up. So I think that's very prevalent at the college level for sure. So it's something to keep an eye out for nationals. What's next, Keith? All right. Uh, let's talk about, I, I actually have a question for you, Charlie. So the, the tour model, I feel like has become quite popular in ultimate. We've seen a number of different tours. Uh, you know, the most recent, obviously being the continent tour, uh, mm-hmm. which I think had, had a, a Different question about evaluating the content tour and, and its success, but certainly people were excited about it. The participants were very excited about it. Uh, got a lot of hype. But do you think that we're going to continue to see this kind of touring model used by organizations to hype up groups in the community, to showcase people within the community? Do you think the model is is something that will endure? Yes. I think the reason it works well is that It's a time limited thing that you know isn't going to be, you know, coming around again. And so there's more of a sense of this is an event that I should go and watch and, you know, tune in for. And I think it makes it a lot easier to make the economics of this kind of thing work. Because if you're going to have people flying around, moving around, to go to different cities to do this kind of thing, you need people to show up. 
And I think it's very clearly established at this point from what we've seen in the semi-pro leagues that it's difficult to get people to show up week after week. But if you have a one-off event, you can get a lot of people to come out for that. So I think that the the basic idea here is going to work. The question is, you know, what's the next tour? I, that I don't know. But I, I think the idea of like a barnstorming type tour event makes sense for Ultimate because of the size of the market. Uh, it's hard to get all of the ultimate people in the community to come out for six AUDL home games. It just it doesn't happen in most cities. Attendance is a big struggle. So what makes it easier, I think, is having these more limited series events that makes it possible for you to kind of like market this one thing, say this is the time, come out, you know, get your ticket, and then everybody comes out in the community and goes to that thing. And that's great. Um, you know, it's the same way that the first home game of the year gets great attendance. And then, you know, game three is looking bleak out there. (laughs) So I think the, the tour concept in general of or just sort of like limited, uh, run series makes it possible to really, you know, do the ticket sales necessary to make something like that work. I I wouldn't mind seeing more, more one-offs though. You know, I, I think that pure one-offs. Yeah. I think, I think like, you know, I think that the, the color of ultimate and like how much of a spectacle and event that really felt like. And, you know, I think about the potential additional challenges that come with trying to shuttle a group to multiple locations. Uh, I, you know, I, th- I think that that probably has additional expense. It limits the people who can participate. Uh, maybe it's a little more interesting. So maybe it attracts more participants, but uh, I, I think I, w- I think seeing more like individual one night showcase stuff or maybe weekend showcase stuff uh, could be cool. And I, I don't know if we'll if we'll get more of that, though. I'm, I'm not sure if people are clamoring for it, but uh, I think it makes for a great media presentation, too. Well, let's talk about this then. This is a question from Alex. What can the Western Ultimate League do to get more than a thousand fans at the Winter Cup, which is coming up in a week and a half in San Diego? Uh, buy plane tickets for people. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, that's a tough ask for a fledgling league that hasn't had a chance to build up its fan base yet. Uh, I do think the winter cup will feel like an event, but you know, it's different than, you know, for example, having the playoffs at the end of their first regular season, like having a championship weekend, like we saw from the premier ultimate league, uh, which I think might stand a better chance of attracting Fans, I just don't know, you know, having, you're going to have to draw locally. There's just not a lot of people who are going to be able, who are going to be interested in the expense of traveling to the location for this event, I don't think. So if you can draw up that interest without building the narrative that comes from a season, uh, I would be very impressed. Uh, In actual strategies, you know, I, I think you'd have to, we've talked a little bit about this, but with you know, USA Ultimate, like trying to make, trying to make the 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 weekend you're targeting a celebration of Ultimate more than just uh, uh, some games, some showcase games. You know, whether that means having uh, dialogues and conferences or a disc golf tournament or you know whatever kinds of a concert, I don't know, whatever whatever thing might attract people to the sort of like festival atmosphere that brings people to travel for a weekend of, of, of like social work. So I I don't know what that, what that entails, like how possible that is. It's a big risk. I mean, those things are difficult to put together and obviously they don't work. It's, it's a nightmare. Uh, So I don't know if, if that's the type of risk, you know, someone like the Western ultimate league is in a position to take, but that's the type of thing I think that could attract, attract numbers, you know? I mean, I I just think it's straight up a challenging number to get to because we haven't seen that many ultimate events, period, get to a thousand people in attendance. I mean, I'm not even sure if the club national championships semis and finals have a thousand people on hand watching, maybe over the course of the weekend. And that's including a lot of players and teams who are at the event. But I mean, I'm serious. Like, I don't know if there's a thousand people in the stands for those for the finals. I I think you could have. You know the the U.S. national and Canadian national team play a scrimmage there, and it wouldn't change it. It's not a talent thing, right? It's not like right. a 
the players aren't good enough to attract people. Uh, it's it's just like people don't need to go and watch live ultimate in that way right now. We just haven't created that type of market yet. Yeah, I I, mean, I, I think the 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 bigger thing is you know just really drawing locally. Like, can you sign up local groups to come out? Can you give away some tickets? Honestly, like sell really cheap group tickets to schools and clubs and things like that. Can there be um, a local hat tournament, you know, beforehand? Something right, that people are coming right. out for and then but, they just I mean, stay. you basically need everybody in San Diego and LA area to come out. I, I, when I say everybody, I mean like ultimate Frisbee community right. people. Um, if you can get people to come who are not sort of directly affiliated, then that's great. Um, but you know, I think a thousand is, is, a, is a reach. I don't think it would, I don't think it's necessary to get to that number to have it be considered successful. Um, I think you can get to that number online with streaming. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, there's not a lot of places that are pulling a thousand people for games of ultimate anywhere. So to expect it to be done by the Western ultimate league in sort of their first big official event is a stretch so next up here uh keith i guess you're picking one all right uh we we this one this one's a, a bit of a a bit of a sizable question uh we we're asked who are the best seven in each division that didn't make all club based on your evaluation of them as players not necessarily just on their 2021 performance so using the all club as as kind of like a eliminating a sub subgroup of people even though the criteria isn't necessarily the same uh, who would be your best seven in each division? That's a tough one. All right, I'm going to go kind of fast and just give you names. Um, I'll start in the women's division and just like throw out some names of folks who were eligible but did not win. Because I think if they like didn't play club or something this year, then they're not considered eligible for this uh, this discussion. So I would go with uh, Claire Chastain, Sophie Knowles, um... Valeria Cardenas. Uh, gosh, who else? Cassie Swafford, maybe. Marika Austin, maybe. Erica Bacon is a really good player who, you know, kind of was under the radar because of the switch to, to Parcha this year. Um, those are some names. Keith, who, who would you add to that list? Uh, I feel like I, I feel like I'd probably go deeper perhaps into the top teams mm -hmm. um so you know someone like angela zoo uh alika johnston um you know i'm sure we could go down the list on on fury uh trying to think of of the players on fury who who weren't all the way up there uh right now uh anna nazaroff uh Kayla Helton. It's 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 a it's a difficult challenge uh to separate what you just saw recently from like your your full career view of players. Sure. I mean, especially because a lot of the people who made all club are like the kinds of players we would expect to mm -hmm. be on the world games team. So let's keep let's keep rolling here. Uh, mixed division. Who who would you go with, Keith? So I'm looking at our, our the top of our of our list. This one, uh, you know, I, I think there are some. I think this one has a little bit more obvious players for me. Uh, so, you know, I would say like Jack McShane, uh, Gina Titcomb, Amber Sinecrope, uh Jenny Faye ended up making it. Um, Jesse Schaffner, uh, Henry Conker. There, there's, there, I, I feel like these ones. There's a, you know, Khalif El Salam. There are definitely some some candidates in the mixed division because, it, in part, because I think that we see the, yeah, like a really spread out even in the voting among mixed division. Sure, uh, you know, Nick Snuska, mm -hmm. Zach Sabin. Zach Saban, you know, somebody who just had a really good season and barely missed the cut. But I think, you know, probably belongs in that conversation. Like, Zach Saban had three first team votes and didn't make one of the top, you know, all first or second team. 
So that shows you like there's a little bit of a disparate sense of where he belongs, but still really like a very impressive player this season. Um, you know, Peter Pryle is another guy who's like yep. super solid. Um, I thought Michelle McGee played really well this year. You mentioned Chena Tickcomb. I'd also say Steph Lim. Uh, did you did you say Kelly Johnson? I did not. I did not she say didn't Kelly make Johnson. It, right? I mean, Kelly Johnson, like, you know, is arguably like if you were going to look at the mixed division, be like, who could make the World Games team? Like, she would be among the people that you would bring to mind. Even though I don't think she even got votes. That doesn't speak to her ability as a player. I just think you know its role and how you played this in this very abrupt season. What okay, let's go, let's go to men's. Let's go to men's. All right, so oh boy, there's a lot of options here. Um, some people who made teams for me: um, Sam Little, Grant Lindsley, a couple of you know very good players on Pony who didn't didn't get that recognition this year. Uh, Thomas Edmonds, I thought was had a super season. Uh, ben Yacht. Yeah, certainly don't forget we're, we're looking at we're looking at overall talent here more than overall that, talent well okay I, yeah I, I i stand by little little and lindsley like maybe i don't put thomas edmonds on the list but i would be curious to see what thomas edmonds would do on a top level team these days uh eric taylor yeah that was one that was that was sitting there for me as eric Nate taylor goff michael ing joe white there's, there's a bunch of players well yeah i mean joe white <laughs> The talent level through the roof for that guy, but I mean, had a terrible season. Yeah, yes, he did not have a great season, but I, I think we all know about the uh, the talent present with, with Joe White. I think, it, it, yeah, Eric Taylor's a, a great pick. Uh, Michael Ling was somebody we talked about as well. Um, you know, and what do you think about somebody like Anders Jungst? Feels like not feels a guy that people were talking about. But I mean, he he had a great season, crazy year overall, AUDL and club. What about what about Ben Yacht? Well, I think Ben Yacht. I mean, absolutely. I I think he was one of the big reasons Pony's offense got going. Well, here, they here's one. Right here's, until he showed up. Here's here's well, we didn't we also didn't mention Dylan Freechild. Speaking of separating people from yeah. their seasons and their their careers, he or, should be one A on the list. How about how about this one? This this one I think is a, is difficult to tease your your long view versus your short view. Rowan McDonald. What's what's your Rowan McDonald take right now? I think he's past this peak. Great player, but I just I I I think, you know, came into the year a little injured. Played solid, but never really was the guy that he's been the last few seasons. And that's not to say he's not good. I just don't know if I would put him on that list at this point. It's interesting because he really, it really felt like he was asserting himself as, you know, a potential top 10 player in the division. And then there was a sense that he took a step back for his role. But now it's, it's like, is that his ability? Is it, is his, is it his, his overall ability to contribute has also declined? I, I really don't know. I don't know. It's it's it can be hard to tell, and and you know if there's lingering injury that can really cause problems. You know we we've seen like look at. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good analogy from another sport. I, Steph Curry is having this incredible season after a year that was super forgettable, both for him and for the team, because he was hurt. And now he's back playing maybe above the level he's been at in the past. So I think you know it's hard to assess. You know where's the injury. If you're playing at eighty percent, eighty five percent all year, that has a real impact on your ability to, you know, just be effective on the field. Ben Sadok, another one for me. Oh, it's an interesting one. I feel like he's just a little too turnover prone. Yeah, he's definitely a shot taker. Great player, great player, but Which also calls to my Babbitt, by the way. But uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we we not exactly a clear like top twenty one overall from across the three divisions but uh you know it, it will g- give you a sense of of who we think would have been been uh top sevens for us after that after that all club group 
Okay, uh, let's do some more picks. Who are your picks to make Beach Worlds? This one comes from Jeremy. Are there any players who might not make a regular Grass Worlds team, but have beach specific skill sets? I, I'm, let me let me just answer this first. Yes. Uh, super yes. <laughs> I don't know who those players necessarily are because of how little Beach Ultimate there is played at a high level or that I have ever watched. But I guarantee you that that exists. Like people who play regular Beach Ultimate surely have an advantage over the stars on grass who show up for tryouts. And, you know, where you draw that line, I think, is a, is a, is an interesting decision for the coaching staff. But I, I think there certainly are players who are going to make the Beach Worlds teams that people are going to go, really them? And it's because they are good on beach specifically. Absolutely. Uh, it, it is a... It is a very different skill set, I think. Uh, you know, a subsection skill set where you know people who and I've talked to some of the beach coaches about this. We had a couple with us uh, at the club championships working with with LT World. Uh, I work closely with Brian Jones as, as a coach as well, so I've gotten a chance to talk to them a little about you know the, the what makes beach ultimate and, and overheard them uh, what makes a, a player really good at beach and you know being able to. Speed is is one of those things that changes a lot. You know, sand has that impact. If you are if you're fast on grass, you may not be fast on sand. Uh, if you're explosive on grass, you may not be explosive on sand. Some people they are both. Uh, you know, someone like Jesse Schaffner, I think, is has every bit of the burst that she has in in grass on on sand. Uh, but someone like Mario O'Brien, who's not exactly going to smoke you on grass fields. I mean, that's not the strength of his game. But he's someone who I could see being really good at beach. Uh, so uh, you know that having a little bit of craft can go a long way. But also, I think some experience in moving around in the sand, in playing in that environment, uh, in playing with a four-person team, uh, you know, that all that stuff can be be really useful. Do we have do, do we have tryout lists? Is that public information I somewhere? I, I actually don't know. I actually don't know. That one kind of flew under the radar. I mean, there's a great write-up from Alex Rubin on Ulti World about the tryouts he was at the west coast tryouts mm -hmm. and talked to coaches got got great quotes check that out uh it's got some it's got some players called out in there and i, I think you know alex even wrote about the fact that there are players who seem to excel on the beach or feel more comfortable in the beach setting uh you know even if they weren't the biggest name stars that we'd expect to you know kind of dominate in these tryout settings um you know it's just like raw speed is muted on beach and it's more about like quick first step and the ability to like churn the legs in the sand. Um, and so I think throwing becomes more important than, you know, your raw athleticism. So it's an interesting thing. I, I, I'm not sure. Beach is just such like an underdeveloped part of elite ultimate right now. Agreed. Beach and, Nationals, which happens every year, is kind of like this weird sort of like fake tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's fun for the players who go, but it's not a national championship in any meaningful sense. It's like a pickup tournament. And I, I think that it's I think that it's so under underdeveloped that there's not a full pool, pool of players who have you know started to maximize their beach game. I think there's sure. probably a handful of players who are at these tryouts who are like, okay, beach is my thing. Like I'm right. good here. This is where I excel. Everybody else was just trying to make it work with the talents that they have. All right, let's go to uh, one more question. Then we're going to take a break and come back with some more uh, college quick hitters and some uh, sort of scheduling slash formats discussions. Uh, this one comes from Jersey Tamer. What would be your ideal wind rules ultimate? Let's assume you can perfectly measure whatever you would define as windy conditions. Has anyone actually made or applied a test rule or item set for wind altered games? I mean, we've I've answered this question. It's been a little many times over the years since we've since we've called up. The, the, do we need to call up Sean Childers right now? Do we need to have him come on the show? To, <laughs> the to the OG the like the downwind team plays down a player, <laughs> and if you pull it out of bounds, it's like a fifty yard penalty. Yeah. And like like a, all it kinds was like a thirty stuff. yard field, like thirty yards in length or whatever. <laughs> Uh, I mean, in a more realistic sense, I think that absolutely we should be considering ways to adjust the game for high winds, um, which, you know, I don't know how you, you'd use some sort of wind measuring device. And if it got above a certain level, then, you know, you switch on these rules. I am very interested in seeing 
uh, different disc options. How would a more overstable disc or a heavier disc do in windier conditions? I, I, I mean, people may say this idea without ever having tried it or knowing anything about it, which annoys me because in disc golf, you switch discs when it gets windy. It's, it, it's a fact. So why wouldn't we try that in Ultimate? Like the Ultra Star is not a well suited disc to high wind environments. If you are throwing upwind, it is extremely difficult to get that disc to fly properly. And credit to those players who have managed to master the control of that disc with the angle of release and the spin required to get it to fly more than 35 yards into a strong headwind. But I mean, it just breaks the game. We've seen it. So I am absolutely of the mind that we should come up with ways to either adjust the the disc itself, which would be my number one thing to try first, or potentially adjust the rules in order to mitigate some of the, uh, you know, just the, the huge penalty of losing the flip in a game like that. And, you know, knowing that it's going to be extremely difficult to score up wind at any point in the game. I'm, I'm fully on board with, with what you're saying here in, in large part, because the real problem is, is that, the game is not functional or fun at a certain point. Uh, you know, once once we're unable to complete throws past a certain distance with any sort of reliability, the game's just not interesting. It's not interesting to play. It's not interesting to watch. So inserting a disc that might be able to keep the completion percentages at a meaningful level. I mean, if you ever watched players who've never played ultimate before try and play and they can't <laughs> throw, even if there's no wind, it's just not entertaining. And it might be fun for them and for, to some degree, but you know, if you watch them play long enough and they're turning it over on every possession, they may not really be having that much fun either soon. So uh, it's this is something where it's like fundamental to the game that you need to be able to complete passes and gain yardage, uh, advance the disc. And there's a point where the win prevents that. I, I, with the win rules idea, I'm not exactly sure. You know, yeah, disincentivizing, uh, you know, punts is probably one. You know, trying to weigh upwind scores for more is another one to to attack it. It's a difficult proposition, though. And also, like, how do you enforce? Like, let's say you come up with a with a number. Let's let's say 20, 22 mile per hour winds. We we use wind rules. Wind is not a consistent thing. It it it, it again it ebbs and flows. You know, there's stronger wind and there's weaker wind. Do you, do you take the do you take the wind rules back when the wind goes back down to sixteen miles an hour? Uh, I, I don't, I, I feel like it would be really difficult to do this in practice. The thing is, if the game is going to be substantially improved by changing the disc, then I think that, that teams could agree like, Hey, let's just switch discs and we're going to agree to play with this disc. And if the wind dies down at halftime, you say, Hey, should we switch back to the ultra star? Great. The disc switching is, I think a lot more manageable than we're playing by different rules. Point by point. I agree. I agree. That's why I kind of advocate for that. I would really like to see it tried. I mean, I'm going to keep beating this drum until I, you know, break the drum, I guess. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, formats, college nationals, a little bit more coming your way in this mailbag episode. Stay with us. Welcome back to Deep Look. So let's get into some more mailbag questions here. We're going to talk some college. We're going to talk some formats. Uh, let's begin with a big format conversation, something we've discussed. Um, and it, I think it takes on a little more salience this year because of all of the new formats we've seen for regionals, particularly with the mini brackets and sort of the, like double elim brackets that are sort of disguised in the <laughs> pools. Um so here's a question that comes from Kyle, and there were some other questions on just t tournament formats in general that we've seen this year. Would a Swiss draw into a bracket work for the yeah, college Yeah, do I need to hear the rest of the question? Obviously, we're, we're so pro-Swiss draw on this, on this <laughs> channel. So the question is, you know, that the goes on is, is it a fair way to decrease pool play games and increase intrigue if the World Cup draw format is integrated, as has been discussed on the pod before, you said you could use those groupings to begin the first round of Swiss draw as well. What are your thoughts? I, I look Swiss draw is awesome uh, as far as you know efficiency. Uh, I, I'm I'm not necessarily in favor of of the a bracket style of Swiss draw per se. Uh, 
you know, I've, I've talked about my experience with, with uh, Swiss draw and how there was actually a computer system that handled it so that you were constantly getting matched up, but you had a, a big pool of players. You know, we're, we're not always, sometimes we're smaller groups, but a big pool of players, which is not necessarily here. The, the case when you have, you know, 20 teams, uh, it's difficult to avoid rematches, which is kind of like part of Swiss draw by definition, unless you're just in a, a bracket situation. Um, it does, it definitely decreases pool play games. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we've seen it used this year is to decrease the number of games required and it certainly increases intrigue. I mean, I think that the the stakes uh, of having, you know, very few opportunities to get through to the next round it, it is high, and that may, that's exciting. But we have to remember that these these formats are not simply designed for spectators. You know, they're not. There's a a different part, of, different things being weighed with the value of these formats. Uh, one's competitive equity. Another is probably spectator value, and the other is, is player value. You know, players want to show up and play games. It's the reason that we probably will never see a single elimination format at a USA Ultimate Championship event because nobody wants to exactly. pay all the money to fly. We just talked about how expensive this year's going to be. No one wants to fly out there, lose their first round, and be done, you know, especially if you're a team that is going to have to play against uh, the top teams, you know, and, and maybe you're not at that level. I mean, it's not a very fulfilling experience. Uh, although, you know, I'm, I imagine you'd hear something different from teams that play in March Madness, you know, but it's it's a different environment. Maybe not a fair comparison. All that said, I, I mean, I, I'm in favor of doing more hybrid stuff that is going to change the way that we are playing the games. I, I do think that trying to limit the number of games teams are playing in one day is good, although the current championships format only has two to three games a day in, in any given day. So – that's less of a problem here, but you know we've talked a lot about how to how to move around the scheduling, and if this allows you to do the finals in the evening one night without adding an extra day, like maybe it's worth it. You lose some of the games, you lose some of the value for the players. I don't know if they're going to make that trade. So, uh, it, it, figuring out whether or not it's cool and whether or not it's it's ever going to happen and is something that the players want are different questions. Yeah, I, I, I can't say that I would have a good sense of how to manage Swiss draw with 20 teams, like at D1 Nationals. Um, I think that the concept is a good one. I think it means that you can... Because right now, if you don't win your pool at D1 Nationals, you play five games to get to quarters. That's a lot of games. You have four games of pool play, and then you also have a pre-quarter which is the fifth game in two days. And then, you know, you have quarters in the morning the following day. Uh, that's a lot of games to go from 20 to eight. So could you do, could you get, if, if teams went three and O oh in three games in Swiss draw where they were power match the whole time, basically they'd be into quarters, right? Cause you have 20 teams. So you go down to 10, one win, Five two wins, and then somehow you'd have to manage yeah, you, dealing you with can't, the one odd team you know, out there without without some sort of weird it's thing. You can't straight bracket it unless you either shrink to sixteen or increase to thirty two. Right, but let's say you just say okay, you know, four of those teams play, you know, the two and O teams play each other. One of the two and O teams plays a one and one team, but if any team gets to three wins, you feel comfortable saying okay, they're in quarters, and then. Four games should do it for everybody else. Where if you're, you know, three and one, you're going to be good. If you're two and two, it probably comes down to some kind of point diff situation, and you're probably not getting in at one and three. So I, I don't know. I, I I'm totally interested in seeing it tried, but I'd probably prefer seeing it tried in a lower stakes tournament uh, before we watched it at college nationals. Right? Like, let's have Stanford invite go to 20 teams per division and do Swiss draw. That's historically a tournament that has tried out, you know, experimental rules and things in order to give some, you know, kind of a testing ground. Let's keep it going. Like I, I cannot state enough times how much I think we should be more experimental and trying new things with our rules. Uh, it's way too stale. I'm with it. Let's, let's, let's see. I'm glad that we're starting to see it. I mean, I still think that, 
I promise that the USA Ultimate score reporter like makes it look worse than it is right now. All the experimental <laughs> formats for regionals like look like a disaster. Everybody's super confused trying to flip through score reporter. Uh, in actual practice, they're not that complicated. It's not that complicated to play. It's not that There's essentially just brackets leading into other brackets. It's double yeah, it's not brackets. Hard, but score reporter is not uh, not you, built if for you this. Play in, if you play in your pool and you go 0 and 2, do you deserve to be in the bracket? No, you don't. Sorry. Thanks for coming. <laughs> You're in consolation. Sometimes so, I think about that when people are complaining okay. about, uh, you know, how come this region gets a, uh, how come the Metro East still gets a bid when there are five or six better teams in this other region? I'm like, yeah, but if you're the fifth best team in your region, like, is it that important that we make sure you're at nationals? <laughs> like, come on. College sports is all about representation from every conference, region, whatever you want. We're, to call we're it. firm believers that it's everybody that should way. have a chance. Every every team should have a chance. Imagine being in the Metro East and being told, "Oh, you, your region didn't qualify for any bids this year, so you're just not." Oh, we're rioting. Postseason. We're rioting. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, uh, here's Nick. Both of you talked about up and coming teams appearing in this year's club nationals and those teams having real upsides moving forward, while also noting some real competition that was missing in action in this year's series. Do you think now is the time to bump up the club event to 20 spots, much like college nationals? Keep in mind, I will say this, that does mean moving the event from 48 teams to 60. I've I've not been in favor of this. Uh, I feel like I feel like I'm on not on an island here. I mean, I feel like I'm in the minority in this, but I hate to say it, but I think that's because a lot of people are focused solely on the men's division. <laughs> I think a lot of people see, you know, all oh, these men's division teams. There are good teams that are being, you know, at regionals and competing and not getting to go. Uh, I don't I don't think that that's necessarily the case across all the divisions, uh, and. I, I, the sixty team team thing is another is another strike against uh, to me moving to a bigger event. Although you know if we can house it, if we can make it work, we I think we've also seen the advantages of having more teams all, all at once. Uh, so you know if we get that Blaine Minnesota complex, you know in the in the budget we can we can we can bump it up. But I, I don't I don't know that I necessarily need to see more bottom seeds getting beat handily uh, at the club championships. If we think that it has some sort of you know, value to those teams and that it'll trickle down into the community somehow, which, you know, trickle down's always, always been a great, it's always worked really well. Uh, <laughs> you know, then, then maybe that, maybe it's worth it. You know, if, if we feel like by doing that, more teams will get exposure to high level ultimate and enhance their own communities when they return, uh, that's potentially a cost that it's a uh, cost worth paying to get that benefit. But I don't know that I necessarily see that right now. I want to see resources going towards improving the experience of sectionals and regionals. I mean, I, I don't really feel strongly one way or the other about moving to 20 teams. I don't think we've seen enough competitive depth in any of the divisions to feel like that that's necessary. Like, who are the teams that are missing out in that 17, 18, 19, 20 range that would have gone and like actually done damage at nationals? I mean, maybe once in a while it happens because a team has a horrible regular season or something and doesn't earn a bid. But for the most part, the new rules of the TCT, they don't really allow teams to get screwed like that because, you know, the Canadian teams can't just sit out and show up at, at sectionals anymore. So I, I really think I want to see the experience of playing club ultimate improve for everyone who doesn't go to nationals. That's a lot of teams. That's a lot of players. And for the most part, a lot of the experience there isn't very good. I'm sorry to say it, but a lot of sectionals tournaments are horribly run. Even some regionals tournaments are pretty embarrassingly run. Let's be honest. This has to get solved. And I, I don't think it can be sort of like a central planner thing that gets it done. USAU can't run, go in and run all of the eight regional tournaments. It's just not going to happen. There have to be incentives. There have to be things set up so that there is like continuity over time with these tournaments. And I can't say it enough times. Tournament directors need to be able to make money and then you know, have an incentive to put on a great event from which they can earn money. So I I don't know. Like every it seems like every year there's people are scrambling to find a sectionals coordinator to run the tournament. 
And think about that, like, that's just a bad experience for teams who are the, you know, the bulk of the club division. The bulk of teams do not go to regionals and the bulk of the, definitely the bulk of teams do not go to nationals. So how much more emphasis do we really need to put on making nationals bigger and better? I'd rather see some kind of wild card play in tournament, which gets more teams there and is fun and actually offers this like cool setup where you can have teams get tickets if they don't make it in. Like I, I've talked for years about ideas of, of ways of kind of getting more teams involved in that postseason hype, but just adding four extra slots, uh, I don't know. It doesn't do a lot for me. Eight, eight team, eight team nationals with an accompanying 14 team division two nationals or whatever. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I I just started watching Top Chef for the first Charlie, time. Charlie, somebody was. Telling you know, this me, is like I arguably know. my favorite TV show. I did not know this. I'm watching Chicago right now. I think I have one episode left, so I'm about to see the finale here, probably this week. The somebody was telling me, Keith, and you maybe you can talk about it more in future Top Chef episodes uh, or seasons, I should say. The players who get el- or the the chefs who get eliminated go into like a backdoor bracket where they go head to head and it's like a one-on-one battle to like be able to get back into the bracket. Something crazy like that probably wouldn't work at uh club nationals, but maybe there's something <laughs> yeah, there. It's, it's called last chance kitchen. Uh, last chance. Uh, yes. Kitchen. It's, it's uh, like basically you, the a chef that got eliminated then goes against the person who's holds the last chance kitchen crown. So you keep, you keep staying in Last Chance Kitchen until you get to the end where you face each chef that gets eliminated. Uh, and then you, you can win your way back into the competition. Sometimes, they, sometimes they've even done it like split. So halfway through the season, you get in and then they do it again from there. Uh, but yeah, they use it as a separate like web streaming show too. But yeah, I mean, that, that kind of idea could, could potentially work. You know, it's more games. It's exciting. Yeah. So last question here. What do you think caused the string of upsets at club nationals? And do you think it will continue at college nationals? That is a good question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what caused the string of upsets. I mean, I think part of it was uh, not necessarily understanding how good teams were uh, from the regular season. But, I, I, you know, we also had shifting rosters. I do think we are probably going to see it continue in the college championships. I don't know necessarily how we will define upsets. You know, seeds is one of the ways that we do that. For us, obviously, looking at things like the power rankings, just kind of like uh, something that codifies our expectations. I do think we will see that. You know, I think that this is something we see at the college level because of just like the inconsistencies of players. But I also think they're just – teams do not have a lot of reps together right now. And that's going to lead to a wide variation in their level of play from game to game or even within games. So I do expect us to see uh, upsets at nationals as you know teams, especially with, with the different types of talent levels you're going to see dispersed across rosters. I, I do think that we, we could see some, some fairly fluky results. And you could see stuff like you know weird tiebreakers where a team loses a game that we didn't expect them to do and then wins a game we didn't expect them to do. Like, I can see that kind of stuff playing out. Hundred percent. I mean, because really, we're a lot of our assumptions about teams are based on, you know, far in the past mm-hmm. performance, and then what the snapshot we got from regionals. So, our relative power rankings aren't as meaningful right now because we don't have a full season of data to go off of. There's guaranteed to be some crazy upsets. I mean, there already are at normal college nationals. But this will be especially so, although I will say as a caveat, I do not expect the top seeds, well, top seeds, I'll put seeds in quotes, the top teams, the teams we talked about in our tier list last week as that number one tier, I don't expect those teams to lose until semifinals at the earliest. Yeah, we, we definitely have, have gotten to the point where we feel like you know the teams that we think are going to be good are going to be going to definitely be good and be a lot right. better than uh, than most of their competition. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you'll join us for our subscriber bonus segment where we're going to be talking about Omicron. Omicron? 
Omicron. Omicron. I, I've heard it both. I've heard it both ways. But yeah, a little COVID nineteen update. Will this affect college nationals? Will this affect international competition next year? We're going to discuss next on our subscriber bonus segment. You can join us as a subscriber for less than four dollars a month at ultiworld.com slash subscribe. For Keith Rayner, I'm Charlie Eisenhut saying so long. And we'll talk to you next week right here on Deep Look.